join our WhatsApp group. To get daily latest updates, it's totally free. And all the best for this test. Test is in four part, part one, part two, part three, and part four. Now look at part one. You will hear a man calling a tourist information office to ask about a festival. First, you have some time to look at questions one to seven. Hello, Barham Tourist Information Office, Melanie speaking. Hello. I'm coming to Barham with my wife and two daughters next month so we can go to the festival. But we can only be there for the first two days. Could you tell me about this year's events, please? OK. Well, the festival starts in the afternoon of the 7th with a show by a dance company. The performers are a company from Scotland and the show is called Jumpers. They haven't been here before, but they've got a very good reputation. Where are they performing? In the town hall. The main stage will be used for several of the events. Right. Is there going to be a play while we're there? Yes, in the evening of the 7th. It's being performed by a local amateur group, and it's been written by a member of the group. It's about working for Johnston's, a company that used to manufacture shoes. Years ago, they were the biggest employer in Barham. Thousands of people worked there. It should appeal to all age groups. Good. Presumably that's in the town hall too? No. It's being performed in the building that used to be Johnston's factory. It's been empty for a long time, but it's going to be converted into an industrial museum. Work's due to start on it straight after the festival. OK. I think that'll appeal to my wife in particular. In the afternoon of the 8th, there's going to be a talk by a professor from the University of Barham. I hope it's the same person we saw last year. She was brilliant. It was about the history of clothes, and she said she was doing research into food from the 16th century to the 19th. Yes, that's her topic this year. Lots of people contacted us after last year and, and asked to see her again. She was really entertaining last year, and we learned a lot. And what was her name? I've forgotten it. Uh, Professor Michelson. M-I-C-H-A-E-L-S-S-O-N. Oh, of course. What's the venue for that? It's the assembly rooms. They weren't used last year because the building was being renovated. And is there anything else on the 8th? Yes, there's going to be an evening of fashion presented by students from the local college. The design department there has got a very good reputation, so it's bound to be a good evening. I know my 12-year-old will really love that. That's in the town hall on the main stage. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 8 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 8 to 10. There'll be some workshops as part of the festival, which you may be interested in. Uh, let me see. Yes, two of them will be running while you're here. Uh-huh. There's one for children up to the age of 12. You said one of yours was that age, didn't you? That's right. It's a painting workshop where the participants will learn how to use leaves in their paintings. Last year, the same people ran a workshop on using wool in paintings, they were so popular they'd been invited back. My 12-year-old is very creative, so I'm sure she'd like to take part. And while she's doing that, the rest of us can explore the town a bit. Oh, by the way, the children are likely to get quite messy. 
They'll be provided with an overall to protect their clothes, but if possible, they should take their own towel so they can have a wash afterwards. Okay. What about my 15-year-old? Are there any workshops suitable for her? She's very keen on science. Oh, she's in luck. The other workshop while you're here is run by the science department of the college, and it's an exploration of space, covering all sorts of things from comets to black holes. Sounds interesting. I'd like to go to that myself. Is there anything else? That's all for the two days that you're going to be here. Well, thanks very much for all the information. You're welcome. Enjoy the festival. I'm sure we will. Goodbye. Goodbye. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. You will hear the director of a science museum talking to the guides at the museum. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. Good morning. I'm glad you were all able to come in this morning for a quick briefing on the new wing of the museum, which is due to open in a fortnight. There are six new galleries, plus some other facilities, adding about 40% to the total floor area. When I finish talking... Please feel free to spend some time wandering round and getting familiar with the exhibits. As I said, we have six new galleries, each focused on a particular theme. The Robots Gallery contains a number of machines and numerous sketches by inventors, illustrating the 500-year-long quest to produce machines with human qualities and physical characteristics. There are also cartoons of robots from books and comics showing how robots have long been a big part of popular culture. I'm sure you're all familiar with graphene. Well, this and other wonder materials now form the subject of a gallery. Since our latest press release about the new wing last week, there's been a lot of coverage in the papers and on TV and interestingly, it's mainly focused on these materials. The new gallery of inventions that were never made contains models of inventions that never got beyond the drawing board, like the Great Victorian Way, a 19th century project to build a 10-mile-long loop road in London covered in glass. The scale model we made of this a few years ago has always attracted a lot of visitors, and we've moved it into the new gallery. We've also added models of several other inventions based on the inventor's original drawings. The museum has always had an interest in modes of transport, and the new Land Travel Gallery contains a lot of exciting exhibits, including an up-to-date monorail that visitors can go into though unfortunately they can't travel in it. We've also got a number of related objects on show, from toy models to tickets and staff uniforms, and most of them, perhaps surprisingly, donated by visitors. Virtual reality is an area of science that's right at the cutting edge, and so we're planning to publicise it a lot, particularly using social media. This way, we hope to reach those young people who don't think museums are of any interest, but are familiar with virtual reality from video games. 
We particularly want to show that it has a valuable role in fields as varied as engineering, medicine, and the fine arts. And the last new gallery focuses on the history of forensic science, showing how science is used in relation to law, in particular to solve crimes. And I must say, it's absolutely fascinating. For instance, I was amazed to learn that the first account of forensic investigations was written in China nearly 800 years ago. We're very grateful that a police force has donated their collection to us, as they no longer had enough room for it, and more people will see it here. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. Right, so that was something about the new galleries. Now I'll talk briefly about the basement of that wing, which can be reached by going down the stairs close to the main entrance, or by lift. One of the main reasons for building the wing was to have enough room for a cinema, it just wasn't possible in our existing building. When you reach the bottom of the stairs, you'll see a sitting area in front of you. To get to the entrance to the cinema, you need to turn right into the corridor, and the door is on your right. It seats just under a hundred people, so it's small enough to feel like quite an intimate space. In the existing building, there's a cafe, as you know, and the new wing has a restaurant, so we can serve meals rather than snacks throughout the museum's opening hours. From the sitting area, the restaurant is along the corridor to the right, and it's the second room you come to on your left. The kitchen is beyond the restaurant at the end of the corridor. Now, the shop, an essential source of income for any museum, our hope is that by making its door the first one people get to on coming downstairs, they'll decide to have a look round before or after going to the cinema or restaurant. And finally, we've created a larger space for baby changing facilities than we have in the old building. From the stairs, you go straight ahead, past the sitting area, into a short corridor, and you'll find the facilities on the left. OK, now please go and have a look at them. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. You will hear two students of theatre studies, called Kelly and Joe, talking about their course modules. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. We're already halfway through our theatre studies course, Joe. Hasn't it gone quickly? It certainly has. I've learned so much. Can we chat about the different modules, Kelly? We're going to be asked to fill in a questionnaire about them. Yes, it'd be useful to get our ideas clear in our minds. Well... 
Let's start with the acting module. I thought it was great when the tutor read speeches from plays. He used to be a professional actor, didn't he? That's right. Yes, I agree. He made me try really hard to be as good as he was, and bring characters to life so convincingly. The whole module made me want to become a professional actor. Yes, I bet a lot of the other students thought the same. I certainly did. What did you think of the directing module? Before we started, I had no idea there was so much involved in directing a play. Nor me. I'd expected it to be all practical, but I learned so much from the books and articles that were recommended about theoretical approaches and about professional directors' experience. Yes, I agree. What about producing? Producers really make it possible for a show to go on stage, even hiring the theatre in most cases. You have to be really practical to make it all work. Yes. It was great that there were a couple of people in the class who'd already worked as producers before beginning the course. Yes, I started making a list of some of the problems they'd had, and how they dealt with them. I bet it would make a useful book. I'm not sure I'd ever want to be a producer, though. Nor me. The stage management module was more fun than I'd expected. I didn't know stage managers had so much responsibility. That's right. They're a kind of intermediary between the artistic group, that is, the actors and director on one side, and the technical crew on the other. It must be difficult to keep everyone working together. I'm surprised the tutor didn't put his book about it on the reading list. I came across it by chance in the university library, and got some useful ideas from it. Oh, I read it too. I thought it was excellent. I enjoyed the set design module because I hadn't used a computer to design scenery before, or built a scale model of my design. Both important skills to have. Absolutely. Though I wish the tutor's feedback had been more constructive. I thought she praised our work too much, as though we had nothing more to learn, which obviously isn't true. You're right. And the other module we've had was the history of drama. What did you think of that, Joe? I'm looking forward to next year, when we're going to study particular periods in depth. But it's been good to get the big picture of world drama. Right. So many cultures have created drama over thousands of years. I think it's been good for putting the little I knew about drama into context. The reading list was pretty lengthy, though, wasn't it? It certainly was. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions twenty-seven to thirty. Now listen. And answer questions twenty-seven to thirty. Have you thought about which options to take next year, Kelly? Yes, I think I've made up my mind. I was planning to study musical theater because I really enjoy going to musicals. Me too. But then I thought, I've already read a lot about them even before I came to college, so it would be better to learn about something that's new to me. So I was trying to decide between political theater and the economics of theater. I think they'd both be very interesting, though some of the political plays I've seen or read seem to care about politics at the expense of the audience's theatrical experience. So it's going to be the economics module for me. Uh huh. Theater and society is a definite. I find it fascinating how plays not only reflect what's going on in their culture. But how they can also affect it, and you can learn a lot about a country from its attitude to drama, can't you? That's right. Writing plays is a non-starter because I'm sure I haven't got the imagination to write, let alone the skill. Anyway, I'm planning to do some reading to prepare for next term during the vacation. What about you, Joe? To be honest, I'm not planning to do any preparation. I haven't done all the work from this term yet. I've got an essay to write, which was due last week, 
and I've promised to hand it in at the beginning of next term. I've done loads of reading for it, and now I really must sit down and sort it all out. Something more exciting, though, is that I've managed to set up an appointment with Jeremy Spencer. You mean the actor with the National Theatre? Yes. Lucky you. He's great. The idea is that I'll record our conversation, and it'll be broadcast on the college radio station next term. So I'll need to plan my questions very carefully. All in all, I've got so much to do that I won't even have time to go to the theatre this vacation. That's a shame. I'm going to see a play tomorrow evening, and I want to go to the theatre at least once a week. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. You will hear part of a lecture about the history of energy. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Imagine a world with no electricity, no fire, no way of travelling except on foot, no machines. That would be a world without energy, and it's almost inconceivable to us nowadays. Over the centuries, by using more energy, we've been able to do more and more to change the environment around us. Build better shelters, produce more food, and spend more time on leisure activities. But of course, that hasn't always been the case. If we go back through history, fifty thousand years, no energy was available apart from using our own strength. We depended totally on that. Then we discovered fire and found that we could burn wood, animal dung, and charcoal to generate heat. Around six thousand years ago, people started to domesticate some animals, such as oxen, to plough the fields and increase crop yields. During the Bronze Age, perhaps three thousand years ago, the wind and water were harnessed as sources of power. The first sails were made, enabling boats to travel on rivers and seas, and of course, this increased mobility and trade. In the first millennium BC, primitive windmills and water wheels were invented, which allowed people to grind grain and pump water. These were powerful and reliable, and remained the main ways of using energy for thousands of years. I'm now going to make a big leap in time to the second half of the 18th century, when people discovered the potential of fossil fuels. This led to the Industrial Revolution. Coal had been used for heating for thousands of years, but it was James Watt's development of the steam engine that meant the full power of coal could be harnessed.
Stationary steam engines were first used in 1769 to pump water out of mines. They were far from the sophisticated, efficient pumps developed subsequently, but even so, by 1800, they were producing an enormous amount of power, making windmills and water wheels obsolete. Nothing earlier had compared with the energy generated from fossil fuels, coal, crude oil and natural gas. During the 18th and 19th centuries, the higher amounts of available energy led to a host of inventions and innovations in both industry and agriculture. This agriculture revolution saw many new farm implements made from metal as well as nitrogen fertilisers, pesticides and tractors. These all contributed to a meteoric rise in crop yields, providing enough food to support more and more people. Transport was also transformed with the development at the beginning of the 19th century of boats and trains powered by steam, produced by burning coal. Ships no longer depended on the wind and could even sail against it, and instead of a horse and cart to transport goods, trains could move enormous quantities ten times faster than had been possible previously. During the same century, oil came into its own as a transport fuel, as it was easy to move and had a higher energy density than coal. This was a major factor in the development of the internal combustion engine and the invention of cars running on petrol, a derivative of crude oil, in 1885. Planes followed in 1903 when the Wright brothers flew for the first time in a plane that burned gasoline in an internal combustion engine. The possibility of converting mechanical energy into electrical energy was proved by Michael Faraday in 1831, and 40 years later the light bulb was invented. In 1882, the first commercial power plant was opened, turning coal into electricity, which rapidly came into general use. During the 20th century, more and more energy was consumed, and all sorts of technologies were developed. Now, in the 21st, coal and natural gas are the major sources of power. Oil still dominates transportation and is essential in the manufacture of plastics, among many other industrial processes. Non-fossil fuels generating nuclear, hydroelectric, solar and wind power are growing in use, but still account for less than a quarter of energy use in the world as a whole. All the technologies based on fossil fuels have had both positive and negative effects. They led to a rapid rise in the population and standard of living in industrialised countries. However, we've seen an enormous amount of damage to the environment. Industrialised states are able to dominate weaker ones and inequality is increasing. Because of the increased availability and use of energy, 2,000 years ago the world could only support about 200 million people. Today, that figure has risen to seven and a half billion, though whether the Earth can support them all is a contentious issue. You now have half a minute to check your answers. 